Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's Sam here, the owner and director of Grand Union Finance, here again with another Friday lunchtime live Q&A. And today, our topic for discussion is development finance. Every single week on these lunchtime live sessions, we choose a different topic to discuss, all regarding um, different types of property finance, basically from mortgages through to development finance, as we're discussing today, as well as talking about different strategies in property investing and how you can raise funds for those particular types of property strategies. Um, and as I said, today is all about development finance. And what we've done over the course of this week is we've been asking our clients and followers to send us in their questions concerning development finance and we've picked the the best four that we're going to go through today um, and hopefully I'll be able to give some some good answers to those questions so let's kick off with the first question which is how do I calculate how much I can borrow when it comes to development finance now this one's a really really good question and one that we get answered uh, quite a lot at Grand Union Finance which is um, basically Working out the maximum amount of finance that you can borrow on a particular project when it comes to development finance. Um, so typically, instead of working out um, on, a, on a normal bridge or a mortgage, the amount that you can borrow as a percentage of the purchase price or value of the property that you're buying, the total facility on a development finance deal is actually worked out um, based on the GDV. Now, the GDV, which stands for gross development value, is the value of the property once all the development is complete. So whether you're doing a relatively simple renovation project, whether you're converting uh, commercial um, property to residential units, apartments, whatever it might be, or you're doing a big ground up development, building, uh, buying land and building on it, um, whatever the total value of the end product effectively is what we call the GDV, the gross development value. The lender will work out how much they can lend you in total based on this figure. And typically, um, the maximum really that, you, that you'll be able to get is about 70 percent of this figure. Most of the time, we look at deals where the borrower or our clients are borrowing somewhere between 60 and 65 percent. But if you are looking to get the absolute best rates on the market, you're probably going to want to limit this to somewhere in the region of 50%, maybe even slightly less. Now, as a slight precursor to um, to that, if you are looking for lenders that are going to be lending quite a, um, a low uh, loan to GDV, as we call it, um, to try and get the best rates, just getting a low GDV is probably not going to be the only uh, criteria point that you're going to need to hit. Typically, you're going to need to have some kind of experience as well on top of that. So, um, something to bear in mind. But in answer to that question, um, how much can you borrow in total? This figure is worked out based on the gross development value, not the value of the property, although there are going to be limitations within the overall facility based on how much they'll lend you day one of that facility against the purchase of the of the land or, or property. Uh, but overall, we're looking at um, somewhere between 50 and 70% loan to GDP, depending on the project and the lender. Um, so that answers question number one, how much um, how much can I borrow um, or how much do I calculate that I can borrow um, on, uh, on, a, on a development finance project? So question number two that we've got is how do I work out the maximum term? Now, this is also um, quite a tricky question, uh, but a very good one and one that we get asked quite a lot. Um, so how long should you be taking out your development finance for? Um, a lot of people just seem to assume it's going to be over, say, a 12 or a 24 month period when it's not necessarily as, um, as simple as that. Basically, we what we need to do is we kind of need to work backwards. So we need to look at um, how long it's going to take to um, realize the exit strategy. And what I mean by that is usually the, the exit strategy to the project will either be to refinance it and hold whatever it is that you're creating or developing um, for the long term, for long term investments by way of a refinance, putting some kind of mortgage on it, whether it's a residential, whether it's a commercial mortgage um, or to sell, um, or sometimes it can be a bit of a hybrid, a bit of a mixture of the two. But once we know what that extra strategy is going to be, we can work out how long it's going to take to do that. So it could well be that if you're going to refinance, it might we might allow for three months, let's say, to refinance if it's something quite complicated, like maybe you know a, a large um, 
commercial property that's been converted into 20 flats to refinance that entire block on a commercial mortgage might take a little bit of time. So we uh, we need to allow for that kind of period of time. So there we go. We've got our sort of three months. If we're selling it, we might want it to allow for nine months uh, to, you know, marketing time to sell each of those 20 flats, for example. So we need to allow that as part as the sort of the, at the end um, of our term so we don't go over. Then we've got to look at how long it's going to take to do the build. And I would always add in a contingency uh, time frame for this as well. So if you factored in 12 months for the build and then you know, three months for the um, for the, the the time to refinance it, for example, um, then instantly you're kind of thinking, OK, well, I only need 15 months. Well, actually, how concrete is that 12 month period for the for the refurb costs or the development time? Do you need to factor in some extra time? I would suggest yes, and probably at least 10 percent or round it up. So in this instance, it would be 1.2 months. We'd round it up to two, so maybe 14. Then we'd add in the, the, the three months um, to, to refinance, um, which obviously would then give us a 17 month term. So that's really how we would work out how long the term needed to be, because obviously what we what we don't want to do is we don't want to have the term too short. So that you, um, you you get to the point where you're getting to the end of the term, you need extensions or you might have to pay penalty fees or fines or whatever it might be, which obviously is going to have a big effect on your um, on your bottom line or your return on investment on the project. But we also don't want to leave it too long either because fees and interest are deducted um, as part of the development finance setup. Um, they'll be rolled into the development finance facility. Um, so the larger that facility, potentially the less you can borrow day one towards the purchase or they'll be deducted from um, from the upfront uh, amount, which obviously will have a um, an impact on how much you can borrow up front as well. So we don't want to leave it too long. We want to have a nice happy medium between not being too short, not being too long. And that's typically how we would work it out. How long does it is it going to take for the exit strategy? How long do we take? Is it going to take to market to sell the properties if that's what we're going to do? Or how long is it going to refinance? Then what we do is we stress test, uh, add a bit of contingency onto the time we think it's going to take to do the build. And that's what we'll come up with as our rough estimate on what the term should be and probably want to round up another month on top of that. So if we're looking at 17 for that example, maybe we'll just round it up to 18 and we'll have an 18 month term to make sure that we've definitely, definitely have enough time to complete all of the um, of the work and ensure that we get our exit strategy done. A big, um, this is a big uh, problem that we have a lot of the time is um, lenders, sorry, uh, developers, what they will do is they'll look at at, uh, at the term as how long it will take them to do the build and they don't factor in that um, period of time for the exit strategy as well. So top tip there. Um, so on to question number three then, which is, um, how long does it does a development finance application take? Which is a fantastic question, mainly because we find that a lot of our clients assume that the that development finance is the same as a bridging loan. Um, typically, bridging, you know, a lot of people think of bridging finance as a really speedy um, transaction, which it definitely can be. Isn't always, by the way. It very much depends on the lender and their capacity. Generally speaking, we find that the cheaper the the, the bridging finance, the longer it's going to take to get it done because it's usually with some kind of larger institutional lender. If you're looking with a specialist bridging finance lender, they can be a bit quicker and a bit more flexible. So, but they might charge you a little bit on top of that. But theory, but really, development finance is, although it's part of the bridging uh, loan family, I would say it's very much set apart when it comes to the application process. The development finance is not quick finance. It is a specialist type of finance that you need for particular types of property transactions. So, in terms of the process. Um, there's a lot of similarities between both getting a mortgage or a bridging finance loan, but there are some, some some differences that we need to take into account. So first and foremost, very similar to getting a bridging finance loan, we need to get credit back terms, a decision in principle, um, an offer in principle, whatever the lender wants to call it. It's all the same thing. Basically, just an initial idea of what the costs and the terms and the breakdown of the fees are going to be. We do that by sending a, um, a finance proposal or funding proposal over to the lenders that we believe as brokers um, are going to be the best suited for this particular project. Um, and, and we and we get those those terms back. Typically, this can take up to 24 to 48 hours. Um, and then once we've got those and you, the borrower, are happy, we then convert that into a um, 
into a full application. Now, what we want to do at this stage is we really want to make this application watertight. We want to include all the information that we already know that the underwriter is going to need. So instead of just sending over a, a filled out uh, application form signed by you guys at the bottom, what we want to do is we want to support that application with all the information, not only that the lender has asked for, because they will on their on their terms have a short list of information that they'll need, like ID and proof of address and things like that. And usually if you're buying the property um, and not refinancing it, the source of the uh, of the deposit funds as well. Um, but we know, because we do a lot of these types of uh, finance um, applications, that that is just really the, the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the information that these lenders want. So we need to take some time to basically in-house pre-underwrite the case, uh, we call it, which is where we will look at um, all of the information involved in this case. And we will um, look, look at kind of what due diligence documents we're going to need over and above what's been asked for by the lender, um, analyze those ourselves. And if there's anything in there that could, we think, raise further questions, ensuring that that is covered off as well. This usually takes us a day or so to do. And then we're ready to, to prepare the full application and send that over to a lender. Now, depending on the lender, this will take um, between one and five days um, to get seen by, by an underwriter. There are some lenders that will want to do a face-to-face -face meeting in, the, in this day and age, a Zoom meeting with you, the client, as well, before they maybe take the, the case further to their, their credit team. Um, so, um, or put a proposal through to their credit team, very much depends on, on the lender. But once this is done, we need to then organise, just like a bridging loan, um, a survey of the property. Now, what this surveyor is going out to do is to look at the value of the property now, and to look at what the value of the property may well be once all the work has been complete. So working out the GDV and also looking at the 190 day valuation. Now, what this means is, is if the marketing time to sell this property was was uh, restricted to 90 days, three months or 180 days, six months, what kind of impact that's going to have? Because that this is going to give the uh, lender reassurance that um, it's a property that's in demand and should be able to sell relatively quickly if the worst should happen. Um, so they're going to go out and do that. It's a bit more of an involved um, valuation. We call it a red book valuation. So much, much more than a standard mortgage valuation, for example, there's usually a little bit of additional cost involved and it will take them longer to complete their valuation report and send that back to to the uh, to the underwriter. So we have to factor that um, that time frame in as well, potentially 10 um, 10 days to two weeks uh, we need to factor in for that process. So we're already in for sort of the pre-application process, sort of three three days or so, the application underwriting process, potentially five five days or so, uh, so we're up to eight. Now we've got the the extra, let's say two weeks on, on top of that. Um, you know, we're up, we're up to, you know, we're up to about three weeks so far. The next stage in the process is usually with a bridging loan at that point, we can go straight to offer. Now we can't do that with a development finance loan because what we also need to do is we need to establish that the the not only the cost of the works but the time frame and the cash flow that's going to occur throughout the course of the development um, period is is correct. And in order to to do that, the lender will send out what we call a monitoring surveyor. Now, this monitoring surveyor is very important because this individual will not only be coming out now to look at the project, meet with your construction team, go to the um, go to the, the, the site itself, um, but they will also be monitoring, hence the name, the entire project. So they will be responsible for site visits throughout the project to monitor what's going on and give that feedback to the lender to enable the, 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 the drawdowns to occur throughout the course of the build. Um, and so they will go out and do this. There will be an additional cost for that, uh, they'll meet with your construction team. Typically, the monitoring surveyors can take, again, about 10 days to get their reports back um, and, and um, uh, to the underwriter for sign off. Um, and as I said, the, the, what they're looking for here is to is to look at the uh, whether the costs that have been put in place by the construction team or the project manager um, are correct and whether they think there's, there's any um, disparity in that and also to work with the construction team or the project manager to work out when those drawdowns are going to occur and um, so then what happens is once this this um, is fed back to the underwriter they will take that information and they will issue the formal offer of funding together with a development appraisal which essentially shows when the drawdowns are going to occur and what the um, 
uh, when how much those drawdowns will be for um, in accordance to you know the cash flow for on month, month on month throughout the course of the build. Um, so already at that point, you know we're probably up to about five weeks, something like that, and then we go into legals. Um, so. As, as we know, um, legals can take quite a long time sometimes, even if it's just for a straightforward mortgage. So typically for this, we, we would allow for probably another four to five weeks um, for the solicitors to get everything that they need, um, do all the searches, um, check out on various covenants and, and make sure that all the planning in, is in place and all this kind of stuff. Um, so um, overall, we're in for a, probably about a 10 week period we would factor in for. So about two and a half months is what we need um, in terms of the, the full application process. So quite a lot involved. We have to be on the ball throughout to make sure that we don't lose any time. But if you allow for about two and a half months, then we should we should all be, be OK, to be honest with you. A lot of the time we will speak to our clients. And unfortunately, they've spoken to either the vendor, if it's direct to vendor or the estate agent. And they've kind of given them the time frame as they would if they were getting a bridging loan, which definitely is not the case, unfortunately. And this can sometimes lead to um, a bit of frustration on the side of the vendor and the and the agents um, who have been told that it's going to take, uh, you know, half the time, perhaps, that, that it's actually going to take. So make sure when you are taking out development finance that you're communicating with your vendor and with the agent, who, you know, whichever it might be, that this process is not a quick one and you know we this is the type of finance you're arranging and if they need to ever speak to me I always put that idea forward um, to help with that communication so um, you know that's that's basically the answer to the question how long does it take to um, get a development finance application through so um, hopefully that answered your question so final question then is um, going at slightly left field on this one, but I think it's really interesting, um, especially with the mo at the moment, because lots of people are looking at this. Um, can I use development finance on an HMO conversion? Amazing question. Really, really good question. This because um, a lot of people that are in the BRR space are moving into um other areas because BRR is not giving the returns that it would normally do because of the way that the, the, the property market is at the moment. Um, and one such a way is looking at developing HMOs instead, taking a family home, turning it into an HMO that can be let out on a on a, a room by room basis, which will allow um, a greater cash flow, which then usually represents a higher um, return on, on capital invested, which is which is what we're after. So, um, but the, the question, this question is, can you use development finance? Now, the answer to that is it will depend on the project. Generally speaking, when we are looking at um, standard HMOs, so maybe that might be um, a family home that's being converted in, say, into, say, a four to six bed HMO. This would come under the, classific the property classification C4. Generally speaking, it doesn't take that much cash to make that conversion. I would say on average, I see my clients somewhere between 25 and 40K maybe to do a conversion like that. Some will do it less because they've got the uh, they've got the knowledge and the contacts in order to, to do that conversion for less. But typically, if we're converting a C3 family home into a C4 small HMO up to six bedrooms, the, 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 the costs to do that are, as I said, typically 20 to 40 grand, something like that. Um, and so for that, the, the loan really is a bit too small for a uh, for a development finance loan what we can use in, a, in instead of that is a um, is a refurb bridge now as long as we're not doing anything too substantial and the client has got some experience of doing um, similar types of conversions in the past then or, or refurbishments we can use something called a refurb bridge where we can go up to maybe 85 to 90 percent loan to value on the purchase um, purchase price instead of being limited on a bridge to say 70 to 75. This will enable you to, to release some additional cash to put towards the um, the refurbishment as well. And as I said, because um, with, with HMOs, the, the return on capital invested is usually a little bit higher. We can afford sometimes these, these deals can stack up a little bit um, better when we're looking at, um, at converting to HMO and we can borrow a little bit more and it still works. Um, where development finance might come in is we, when we're looking at larger HMO projects. For example, um, we're looking at something at the moment where a pub is being converted into a 17 bed HMO. 
certainly we are looking at development finance for that particular deal. We can borrow 70% of the day one. And as I was talking about earlier in terms of the overall, as long as both that and the, the bill costs comes to within 65% of the what the GDV is going to be, then we can look at um, getting the development finance covered or the, the development costs covered um, as well as a percentage towards the, the purchase price. The, 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 the costs on that are in excess of 100 grand in terms of the development finance costs. And so we can and get development finance on something like that. So it very, very much depends on the project. Smaller HMOs, we tend to just look at bridging um, or refurbishment bridges if, if they're not going to be knocking down walls, etc., which will give us a little bit more loan to value, 85 to 90 percent. If we're looking at larger HMO conversions, you know, sui generis, that's um, uh, seven bedrooms or above, uh, where you need planning permission to do those kind of conversions, then potentially we'd be looking at development finance because usually the cost of works is that much higher. So hopefully that, uh, that answers your question. So there we have it. All four of our development finance questions answered. Hopefully um, they were helpful. Um, we will we, we tend to do um, sort of every couple of weeks, we'll do a lunchtime live like this. We'll have a very particular um, subject in mind for it. And we will I'll be asking quest for questions to be um, submitted prior to that. Um, but we will tend to repeat some of these from time to time because there's no point just doing a development finance Q&A now and then never repeating that. So probably in the next couple of months, we'll probably do another one uh, where we'll be able to answer some slightly different questions. Um, but in the meantime, um, there is a ton of content over on our Facebook page and on our Instagram page um, at Grand Union Finance for both, um, where you'll be able to find loads and loads of information to do with development finance, as well as all other different types of finance as well. Um, and don't forget to, to check out my personal um, YouTube channel as well, um, which has got a very, very long name, um, which is uh, Sam Norris, the Property Investors Brand. Broker. When I actually put that together, I didn't realise that I'd be stuck with that name um, and I wouldn't be able to change it for a period of time. Um, so check that out because there's also a ton of videos on there to do with development finance, as well as um, all different types of other uh, finance uh, products that you'll need as a property investor and developer. But um, but for now, hopefully this has been a really, really helpful video for all of you. Um, I'll leave you to enjoy your sunny-ish uh, Friday afternoons and have an awesome weekend, guys. I'll catch you on the next lunch time live if you've got any questions uh, do dm us we'll answer them as quickly as we can um, but until then i will catch you on the next video have an awesome weekend everyone See you later.